Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and thanks for logging on. These are tough times, difficult to understand, impossible to explain, but we've got 30 minutes of watch talk ahead of us. I want to welcome our worldwide watch audience and shout out to Sean on the switcher and Garrett on the camera tonight. I'm Tim Masso, your host for this evening. Apologies in advance. And today we are talking everything that comes to mind. We've got your questions, your thoughts, some of my favorite watches on the table. This is the no Rolex show, but we can still talk Rolex. And of course, tonight I am going to be showing your wrist shots because after all, a big part of this is your contribution and your show. So let's jump straight to the folks who make these pixels possible. There is no better place to buy, trade, or sell watches than thewatchbox.com. Over 2,500 pre-owned and vintage watches live right now. Uh, I must also say that if you are in a buying mood, reach out to me directly, tmasso at thewatchbox.com. It's your purchase and pricing question line for any watches you see on this channel, on our website, or on Watchbox Reviews. Let me jump into the live chat, see who is joining. Eric Nielsen, Eddie Landsberg, longtime friend, and one of the collector conversations we're going to schedule once this thing gets back up and running. The 95th Phantom, Cam Tibbetts, DX Mag, Richard K, Blue Shirt Buddha, Richard Teven, Matt Foster, Jay Ninja, Dustin Van Patten, Williams Watches, Aunt G, Amar A. We've got lots of new friends and old, Cull Obsidian and Thomas Burnett. Names I know, Rajiv Mirage joining. I can see we've got, ooh, friends joining from Florida, friends joining from Norfolk, Virginia. We've got Cheeseburgers 87 from the great state of Virginia, the Commonwealth, as we call it here in the United States. Let us jump to some wrist shots. I asked, you answered. James W. is a man after my own heart with his green Tudor Black Bay Harrods edition. We've got a green watch on the table tonight. Russell K. and his Datagraph Lumen take in a bright early spring day. Lovely lighting there and beautifully framed, by the way. And that is, of course, a Datagraph Lumen. They glow by day as well as night. We've got Ryan D. and his new Panerai Luminor, PAM111 by night. That is how you shoot a loom shot, folks. Brightening us with our first loom shot of the evening. And Adrian B. shares his 1967 JLC 21007 and his 1967 Alfa Romeo Giulia Sprint GTV. I am jealous on both counts. Okay, lessons I have learned in my time in watches. Let me jump back real quick to the chat box and see who's here. We've got Pastor Ant joining in from the left coast in California. We've got Amar joining in from Riyadh, staying up late with us, I can see. We've got Edward Ledden of Sweden. We've got Mikas, good to see you, my man. An old friend, and of course, we've got Mark K. We have Budik One joining us from Poland. Thanks again for staying up late in continental Europe. And we've got Monkey Sea Production from Chicago. Pilot Style 123. Good to see you, Mahalis. Good to see you in the box right there. John Hepburn from Brisbane, Australia, getting up real early to join us. Now, I have learned some lessons during my time in the watch industry. Some the hard way, others by virtue of the generosity of strangers. And strangers ultimately becoming friends in many cases. So lessons I've learned, and I want to share your thoughts too, what you've learned as a collector in time. The one lesson I've learned that everyone in the industry should learn is that it should be fine to sell a watch. One of the strangest phenomena that I've run into in my time in the industry is this notion that if you buy a watch from a company, you have to worry about retaliation from the people who just took your money if you then decide to sell that watch. So many times I've had people say that they're afraid to even put a watch on social media because they don't want the manufacturer to catch wind of the notion that they might be selling the watch. And all of this sounds incredibly bizarre as the, the company is doing you a favor by selling you the watch. Now I understand that there are wait lists for timepieces and sometimes companies and dealers do pick favorites when deciding who gets the piece. But at the same time, you know, this is a free society and it's an open society and if you pay money for something you've already squared up the manufacturer you guys are even if you want to then sell the watch either because you saw a profit opportunity because I don't know you want to raise some money to buy a car or art or get a mortgage or simply because you decide at some point that the watch isn't to your taste it doesn't fit or it doesn't look right you should be able to sell the watch 
Now what I found is that this is more often a problem with boutique manufacturers. It's very rare that you hear something like, oh, I can't sell this dark side of the moon because I think Omega's going to come after me. It generally doesn't work that way. It's usually some sort of company that makes dozens or hundreds of watches per year, or it's a company that might make tens of thousands per year, but only a certain number of a special model, and if you get it, you're the golden boy, and if you sell it, you're then blacklisted. So all of this seems remarkably dystopian and askew to me, and I'm hoping that on the other side of this insanity that we're experiencing at the moment, we have a better sense of life priorities in, in life and business both. Jumping into the box, guys, let me know what you think. When you buy a watch, should you be allowed to just unconditionally sell it? upon taking receipt and paying the money. For me, I, I think that's kind of important. I don't think it's going to happen. I wish it would. Right here, I've got Ryan DeLucci saying, exactly, once you buy it, it's yours to do whatever you want with it. And then right here, we've got Quadruple A saying, first time catching live. Quadruple A, thanks for joining in. I can see right here, we've got Jeffrey Rosen from Syas at New York, my neck of the woods. That's not far from where my parents live, and I used to go to debate tournaments at Syas at high school. And then right here, I have Matt Foster saying, Tim, I was looking for a steel corn de vache Vacheron 1955 review. Did not see any. Have you done one? I believe at some point I did a corn de vache review. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that at some point I had, I believe it's the reference 5000, and I don't know if I had a steel example. I think I had white gold, but I, I believe I do have a corn de vache, and I do believe that it's on Watchbox reviews if you search for that. And she's saying the sunglasses are back. You better believe it. We're letting our hair down a bit since these are trying times, and we don't want to get too serious and too formal. That, and I have major hat hair after wearing a knit cap all day, so you better believe those glasses are up top riding high. And then right here, Anthony Napoli saying, Tim, you have to admit it's poor form to flip watches. I believe that's true. I do think there's a difference, though, between flipping watches, which implies some sort of habitual, I, I guess, profiteering and opportunistic selling of your watches versus just deciding you want to sell the watch. Like, I think if you're a good customer, or even if you're a one-off customer, you buy a watch, you're allowed to sell it. Now, if it turns out that you've got, I don't know, 16 $50,000 watches for sale on the Watch Pro Site Collector's Corner, then yeah, clearly you're a flipper. But being a flipper also sort of means you're a dealer. And I don't think that's what we're talking about when we talk about selling watches. Something that's yours should be yours to sell as well. And then right here, I can see, Abdul R saying, your property, your rules. Abdul R joining us from the Black Forest in Germany. One of your watches in, in our wrist shots tonight. And he's also saying, Tim, like buying a car, sometimes when you buy a high-end car, you're not supposed to sell it. Yeah, that's true. There are V12 Ferraris, limited edition models, custom cars, bespoke, you know, a Porsche that might be a paint to sample model that might have gone through their custom house or a one-off by AMG. Some of those pieces, you're actually discouraged from selling. And again, I think that's just ridiculous. If they were giving you the car, it would be a different matter. But once you've paid the money, I believe it's your car to do as you wish. Now, that doesn't mean I would paint it psychedelic like John Lennon's Rolls Royce, but all the same, I do think you should be able to sell or gift the car or watch if you want. Question from Pilot Style 123. The Vacheron 56, have corners been cut or does it have Trinity integrity? If we look back to 2018, Vacheron came out with what was generally described as an entry-level line, the 56, modeled after, I want to say, the vintage reference 6073. I think that was the reference that loosely inspired the lug profiles. Well, a lot of people were up in arms over this line, not because they were available in steel, which they were, and I thought that was a great move, but because the basic self-winding model used a Valfleurier movement shared with, among others, Cartier, which created the impression, since it was neither a Vacheron movement nor Geneva Hallmark, that Vacheron was bringing down its line as a whole. I didn't feel that was the case, because I was there in 2018, I saw the watches, and I felt that even in the case of the basic model, serious changes had been made to make that movement more opulent. The rest of the watch was uncompromised. The dial, the case, the presentation, everything about the watch felt premium. 
Would I recommend it as your first Vacheron? No, not unless you're in love with the look of it. I would say go get a, a Ketalil in stainless steel. The new ones are 100 meters water resistant and for around $16,000 new, you're getting a hell of a Geneva Hallmark sports watch. That would be my advice. If you want to buy a new Vacheron in steel, get the Ketalil. And I would say get it with a black or a blue dial. It's now a water resistant sports watch. It wasn't before. You're getting a Vacheron movement, automatic winding, Geneva hallmark, no regrets, no compromises. But the 56 is a good line. And other than the self winding, all of them, whether steel or gold, are Geneva hallmark and Vacheron movements. So I don't find this to be controversial. Let's take a look at a watch. The Breguet line gets a bad name. When people talk about high luxury today, they're talking about Patek Philippe, they're talking about F.P. Journe, they're talking about independents like Carrie Voudelainen and Philippe Dufour, rarely do they talk about Breguet anymore. And that's unfortunate because investments made since the ownership of the Chaumet brothers in the 1970s and 80s have created a number of models that are all-time greats. And this is the 3337. It's based on the repeating wrist or repeating pocket watch 3833, and a version of this is still in the catalog as the 7337. Now this is a smaller version of that with the 3833 pocket watch dial, which as you can see is a day, a date, and a moon phase. Solid gold, silver dial, cut on a rose lathe. This is real guilloche, not stamped. And again, the dial is solid gold. The watch is only 35.8 millimeters in yellow gold, but this watch jumps off the screen when you take a look at the caliber 502 on the reverse side. Now this is all handmade. If the guilloche dial is impressive, the movement is breathtaking. It is both skeletonized and freehand engraved. It's based on a Frédéric Piguet P71 three-quarter rotor automatic. It has a 21.6 beat rate and as you can see it is an old-school ultra-thin architecture designed to keep the rotor in the same plane as the rest of the bridges. It has elaborate banknote scrolling throughout, skeletonization and not one single surface that hasn't felt the burn of the artisan's burn. Now I'm going to get a little bit closer. Garrett's helping me out here on the camera, so give him a little bit of an online hand, if you will. This is an unbelievable watch with its sides cold rolled to create the coining and the strap retained by bars and screws. Absolutely no corners have been cut. You don't need a Calatrava. You don't need an FP Journe Octa. This is as good as it gets in the world of dress watches and it's a perfect size for any wrist. I don't have any Rolex content on the show today. I picked six watches that I adore because they speak to me right here, less so up here. Now jumping in here, I can see we've got some responses coming through. America is a free society. Sell your watch if you wish. Abdul R. saying, Breguet makes the best guilloche in my opinion. Very underrated and a great buy right now. Blue Shirt Buddha saying, spectacular. Uh, question from Jerome Gold, is everyone at Watchbox okay? Are you still open for business? We are still open for business as an online vendor, but I am here in a building with like five people out of a normal like 85 who work here. So we're definitely operating with a skeleton crew, but if you want to reach out to us, you're going to get someone. And we have all of these watches available. Uh, right here, Simon Holt saying, good lord, that is unbelievable. And Thomas Burnett, that is why Breguet is tops. I love Breguet. I think we are way past the point that the brand is underrated. We spoke so harshly about Swatch Group management of the brand and the 2018 Marine watches. And frankly, everything but the Marine is absolutely unbelievable. And the back catalog of watches like this, save your steel Nautilus money. Those are already out of fashion. Get something like that, because that's just cool, and it has heart. Someone who loved watches made that thing. Right here, Jonathan Siraco asking, Tim, favorite version of the Oris Aquas? I like the 39.5 millimeter uh, clean ocean with the turquoise ceramic bezel and the turquoise gradient dial. That is my favorite version on a full bracelet. Okay, let's talk a little bit about bum, 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 bum. Jeffrey Bialawas saying, Blancpain doesn't get enough love, 50 fathoms coming my way soon. That is a great 
cue to talk about the 50 fathoms on the table. I was going to take some time before looking at another watch, but we have the 500 piece 40.3 millimeter steel Barracuda. Now this is modeled after a unit sold on the German market to both military and civilian customers by a company called Barracuda. That's why the watch uses a German spelling for the name of the organism that inspires its name. This is a lot smaller than your standard 5015. The model you see here is 40 0.3 millimeters by 13.2 millimeters thick. Now technically it gives you just about everything any other 50 fathoms would. Sapphire capped bezel which has a wonderful ratchet. I'm going to hold it up to my mic real quick. Garrett I'll be right back. And the watch features a lovely warm sort of faux tina dial which some consider to be a little bit cheesy but I think as a color combo it works well with the white, the black, the red and the ecru on the dial. You will note it has that same capped bezel with the sapphire on top and the loomed indices and numerals below. Now the watch of course still 300 meters water resistant. You're not giving up any capability. On the reverse side you've got a six position adjusted 100 hour power reserve caliber 1151. It's free sprung with a silicon hairspray to make it a bit more anti-magnetic and more shock resistant and the quality of the anglage on the edge of the bridges is particularly good as it's broad enough to see without a loop, round enough and bright enough to appreciate without any kind of magnification. This is a very special watch and again if you like the 50 fathoms but you think the other models are just too big, this one at 40 millimeters is just right and a 500 piece limited series from last year, one of the best recent efforts by Blancpain. Okay, now a question from CD127100. Is it just me or do alligator straps seem like they are for old people? Well, I think where you're coming from is the notion that alligator straps are more formal and they generally are. Generally you see them on dress watches, you see them on evening watches, you see them especially in black or brown. I do think that the character of an alligator leather strap really changes when you make it colorful. Some of the Jean Rousseau straps that I've seen recently have been very impressive with purple and blue, red and green. And I think when you add color to an alligator strap it gets a little bit younger, but there is the perception that calf skin is sportier, it's what you see on a pilot's watch, it's what you see on a Panerai. And I do think that the gator scale have the look of a dress watch inherent to them, which is why a lot of folks associate them with the Elmer Fudd contingent of the watch collector fraternity. Uh, jumping right in here, we have a question from Rafa asking, well Rafa Santos saying, would you buy a Rolex Explorer or a new Rolex Air King? I like both very much, but given that the Air King is so polarizing, perhaps it will be a better investment down the line. No watch is an investment. Let me just say that up front. And that's coming from a guy who has both models to sell you right now. If you think a watch is an investment, try inflation protected securities. They're great. You won't lose a cent and down the road you won't have to pay servicing fees. Could the Explorer bought new be worth more as a percentage of its purchase price than an Air King bought new? Sure, but bought used, both of them have already depreciated. And we're entering a time when I don't think many watches are going to be money makers. So I would say realistically, if you like the look of the Air King, forget what other people are saying about it. All that matters is what you think. And if you think that the combination of black and white and yellow and green on that dial, the Bloodhound SSC dial as it's properly known, if you think that's cool, get it. Just recognize that there are a couple of different three hand roughly 39 to 40 millimeter steel Rolex sports watches so be sure to cross shop of course the Explorer but also the Milgauss and the Oyster Perpetual 39. You've got a four way competition in the Rolex catalog for your order and I think you're going to find the watch you like but it sounds like you already know what you want. I'd get the Air King. Jumping into the box right here we have Jerome Gold saying I would take the Air King and then we have Bum, 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 bum. Andrew Mark saying, Tim, what, in that, what is that glass cube behind you? It looks interesting. I would say that is possibly the most unusual thing in the studio. It's a lucite cube that contains broken and obsolete watch and clock parts. A company called Bird Vie out of New York makes them and it has a sterling silver number plate inside. They clean all the parts before they freeze them in lucite and the production process is a little bit of a deliberate mystery because these things are absolutely seamless and it's very difficult to judge how the hell they're made. Open a different window, keep me streaming, but check out Bird Vie. We're also a vendor of those. 
Uh, right here, we've got a question from Christopher Peterson. Is the Blanc Path 50 Fathoms as good a daily driver as a Submariner would be? Well, that one right there at 40 millimeters is the same size as a Submariner. So it depends. Do you want to watch on a bracelet? I'd say the Sub's probably a better bet. Do you want to watch on a strap? I'd go with the 50 Fathoms. Every version of the 50 Fathoms, in my opinion, is a more extensively handmade and hand-finished watch, and thus a little bit more special as I read the situation. Let's take a look at your wrist shots. All right, wrist shots too. We've got Abdul R active in our chat right there. Absolutely dazzling, stunning with his Fortis Marine Master B42 Flieger with mood lights. I would love to see how that was set up. Tim M, the other Tim M, and his tag Hoyer Monaco Steve McQueen relax in domestic seclusion as we're all socially isolated. I can relate. Mikhail T and his Omega Globe Master strike a classic wrist shot pose. Love the steel tungsten with the blue dial. And Randy B and his grandfather's 1953 Omega Seamaster take in the sea breeze by the shore. The boats by the water, one of my favorite childhood memories. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your analog on my digital. Lessons I have learned. It's okay to sell watches and change course. I used to think, and part of this was due to my reading of the writings of uh, James Dowling, who I respect above all collectors. He is one of the scholars of Rolex in the entire industry, one of the most lucid and, I would say, unvarnished opinions you're going to find among collectors. And he said that you should have a theme to your collection to have better possession of your direction as a collector. And at one point, I thought I had to collect one thing because that was my theme and, well, God help me, I wasn't going to veer from my plan or my roadmap. And I realized at one point, you know something, as much as I love JLC, I feel like I've completed the theme. Like, everything I said I would own, I owned. And all of my ambitions as a collector had been satisfied. Did that mean the end of collecting? No. I immediately rebooted the collection and got started with a German sports watch, my Zinn, which you all know well. Am I done as a collector? Hell no, but I'm definitely thinking about my next move. And, you know, for those of us who might have saved some money during the good times, this might be a time to buy low on a couple of the watches we've been thinking about. A watch I've been thinking about, frankly, since I was a kid, any watch by Elaine Silberstein. I mentioned this is the no Rolex night, and this is the most non-Rolex, non-Rolex of the lot. This is the Tourbillon Volant, a 40 millimeter stainless steel flying tourbillon designed by the man who started as an architect and became a watchmaker. Back in the mid-1980s, Alain Silberstein, I believe from 1986, was one of the first independent horology brands. Right up until his brand closed in 2012, he was always different in the way that the best French modern art is different. The watches were made in France, and indeed all of the mechanical running gear inside this watch is French, as the movement was created by a company then known as France Bausch, which later became Technotime, and eventually was purchased by Soprod. It has a three-day power reserve with a flying tourbillon, and what can only be described as a modernist, almost postmodernist set of primary colors and basic shapes on top of a fully open, architecturally sculpted machine age dial. Now, if you look very close, I'm going to get a little bit closer here, you could see that it basically says in French, the greatest joy is to love your profession or to have love for your profession. And I have to agree, from the time I saw a Alain Silberstein Rondo in a local jeweler back in my hometown during the 90s, I was in love with the brand because it seemed crazy. They tried to steer me away from that watch for years and it did sit there for years. They said, if it needs service, it has to go back to France. And at the time, I wondered, well, what makes that so much worse than Switzerland? And the answer is nothing. These watches today represent a wonderful way to get into not just extreme complications for reasonable money, but one of the earliest and most influential of independent brands. It should be noted 
that Silberstein, since he closed down his brand, has become something of a celebrity in the watch industry as he's done collaborations with Romagerone, Louis Erard, and also MB&F. So his star is actually on the rise after sinking somewhat during the last financial crisis. You can see everything about this 200-piece steel 40-millimeter watch is different, right down to the clasp itself, which is hollowed out to echo the design themes of the dial. This is a watch that is quite compact beautifully made, thoughtfully detailed, and absolutely irreverent. A flying tourbillon with a French base movement made in France with a three-day power reserve. I can't say enough things about this watch. It even has a little date indicator up at 12 o'clock. And Alain Silberstein pointed the way for the industry. May his name always be remembered and revered in independent horology. Jumping into the box right here. I've got a lot of friends. I've got Paul T. I've got Eric Nielsen. I've got... Richard K, I've got Chef, and ba -ba -ba -bum -ba -ba -bum, Abdul saying, that is one crazy watch, definitely for the fun part in each of us. I got to agree, Silverstein knew how to laugh, and there is too little of that in the watch hobby. And then right here, Adrian asking, any reason for the use of primary colors on the Alas Silverstein? Yes, he was a fan of De Stille, which was a first, third, 20th century Northern European uh, reductionist art form. The idea was to take primary colors, basic geometries, and from those building blocks construct everything from modern art to livable architecture. And Silberstein was a great fan of that. And so what you see in the watch reflects those tastes and those influences. Right here, we've got friends joining from Texas. We've got Edward Letton saying, Alas Silberstein, Alain S. Prost, that's true, there was another great Alain from France, and I saw him at the E. Prix in 2017 in Brooklyn, and he was actually a decent guy. And ba -ba -ba -bum -ba -bum, I could see we've got Watch ask Watch E N E Prey asking, Tim, do you anticipate Watchbox to reduce prices over the coming weeks? We're always adjusting prices, so probably. I would say that the Watches that are probably going to be adjusted are things that are in like the three to five thousand and five thousand to fifteen thousand dollar range. Uh, the higher end watches they they tend to sell in good times or bad. When you have to make adjustments in the watch industry, pre-owned or new, generally it's for the lower end customer who's going to feel the squeeze a little bit more. So if you've got your eyes on some sort of Oris, Fortis, Omega, or Breitling. Keep your eyes peeled. If you're looking to pick up a cheap FP Journe Tourbillon, the answer is probably no. <laughs> Let's jump into the... Oh, by the way, there was a comment. Waco could pull off that Alas Silberstein. I'm waiting for him to do it. The clock is ticking, Way. I'm challenging you. Revive the Alas Silberstein name. Bring us to a new golden era of French charm. All right, wrist shots three for the evening. Quentin R. Imagine summer at the beach. I love the sketch in the background on the cup with his Baum and Mercier Clifton. Victor A. with his Tomasini bike and his American RGM 801 aircraft, a wonderful manufacture movement American watch made in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, hit the road. Cameron T. catches the breeze on Chesapeake Bay with his Corum AC-1 with the distinctive tides complication, flying along on his hobby cat. And David H. of New Hampshire and his Cartier CPCP Tortue Mono Pusher fire it up in front of the fireplace during these isolated times. By the way, that Cordier Mono Pusher with a movement made by THA, a collaboration of Vianney Halter, Denis Flageolet, and F.P. Journe, that machine has a manifold pedigree beyond its Cartier name. To see your pieces on my pixels, Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Send me your wrist shots. How are we spending our time in isolation? You guys let me know in the chat box right there. Eddie Landsberg commenting, I'm picking up my graduation watch soon and I can't make up my mind. I started with two in mind and now I have six. Three are Mosers. Eddie, you know my number. We've met. We're friends. Give me a call or reach out by text. I know the U.S. distributor. I have access to every Moser. I will make a review custom to suit your shopping needs. I'm actually going to have the streamliner in the studio perhaps as early as tomorrow.
How about now? We're back. <laughs> As I was saying, Eddie, we're friends. I'm going to have the Streamliner in for reviews and Instagram next week. And I can get just about anything now because all of the novelties are stuck shoreside. They're not going to Basel or SIHH. They may as well come here. But let me know which Mosers you have in mind. But Owen saying that Tomasini needs to be steel with chrome lugs. I agree. An Italian bike. Steel is real. If it is in steel, should have custom cut chrome lugs as God intended. And of course, right here, Oh, these questions are coming in. Richard K. Tim, tell me, what is your choice between Longa 1 or Longa Up Down? Looking to get Longa budget, not unlimited, hopefully under 20K. Uh, let me suggest the Longa Matic from the Exonia family. 37 millimeters, get one in white gold or platinum. You're getting the caliber 92. You're getting the 921 Saxomat with that monstrous zero reset feature and the double precious metal three quarter rotor in gold and platinum. That would be my first choice. But if you're choosing between the up down and the Longa one, I would say probably go with the Longa one because that is to Longa, the closest thing they've got to an icon. If you're going to buy a Longa and just one, I always tell people get a Longa one, get a Zeitwerk, or get a Datagraph. But again, if a watch like the Up Down looks better to you, get the watch that looks best to you. I'm just giving my advice right here. Let's take a look right here. Ba -ba 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 we got Kyle K saying, I am heavily looking at getting a foot in the door somewhere in the watch industry from watchmaker to selling them at boutiques. Been trying for a while, but no success. Any tips? Yeah, I would say the, uh, something you should do is just go boutique hopping and cultivate a following on Instagram. And once you've got 200, 300, 400 followers, then start applying to boutiques and pre-owned vendors. You know where to find us. We're all on Google. And just say, look, I've already got an existing following on Instagram, you know, derived from nothing so more, much as visiting boutiques. Let me be part of your company and I'll bring that following with me. All of a sudden, people will be calling. I have a clientele that I bring with me in these times. A provable following is worth its weight in gold. In terms of becoming a watchmaker, you got to probably move to one of the centers of such things in the United States, which would mean you want to be in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Harrison, Ohio, uh, Dallas Fort Worth, where Richemont has its operations and school, or down in Miami, where there are a lot of brands, there are a lot of small independent service shops, and there's also the Nicholas Hayek School of Watchmaking. My ambition, above all, is to become a watchmaker, and I'm hoping that once I've won my soul back from Watchbox, they'll allow me to enter the watchmaking department. Until then, I am bound to them by blood. Okay, and then right here. We have comments on the 1815 up-downs being great. That is true. We've, bought, we've got Backer B saying, Tim, new to the channel, loving your content, currently on the hunt for my first luxury timepiece. Your reviews are helping immensely. What's on your mind, Backer? Let me know, and maybe I can help you with the choice right here. And then we've got Ben D. Tim, do we really need precious metals in a tool watch? I would say, in general, the places precious metals are welcome in a tool watch, to me, unless you just want a Rolex Smurf because it's rich and it's it's stealthy or you want people to see your colored gold because it's a status symbol, I'd say you want to see precious metal in hands and numerals or indices on the dial to prevent oxidation. And then I generally like to see platinum or gold used in a winding mass because it's incredibly dense and it does its job well. Uh, I don't like to see tungsten in, in that kind of application. I prefer to see precious metal. Uh, in terms of whether the world needs a white gold 50 fathoms diver, no. But then again, the watch world does doesn't need luxury products. We could all get by with a swatch or even just a phone. So if you like precious metal on a dive watch, you like the way it looks, you like the way it feels, you like the sense that it's something special, there's no reason not to any more than there's a reason not to buy any of these watches. Let's talk about a watch. Now we saw a green Harrods edition Black Bay earlier in the show. This is my favorite FP Journe. Technically, I love the Chronomet Optimum as my favorite model, but there is this one variant of the Tourbillon Souverain, the Jade Dial, also known as the Jade Tourbillon, that absolutely blows my mind and melts my heart. I am a super cynic about the FP Journe brand, and I'm totally not a fanboy. But when it comes to this watch, all of a sudden, I lose my inhibitions. You've got a power reserve, deadbeat seconds, a tourbillon with six position adjustment, 21 six beat, free sprung with an overcoil, rose gold movement, all of that, and a double cut jade disc 
that has been turned into the dial. When I saw this watch being made at F.P. Jorn's factory in Geneva back in late 2017, I lost my mind and I asked why it wasn't sold more commonly. And the answer was weird. They said F.P. Jorn doesn't like to talk about this watch. I don't know why. I've heard rumors that he doesn't like the color green and that he doesn't like his dial factory getting backed up trying to make the dial because the rejection rate is high and they tend to splinter. I don't know why. I cannot say. All I can say is that the watch is conventionally beautiful for a Jorn with a 40 millimeter platinum case and a rose gold movement, but it is the dial that is to die for. This is an awesome piece and it absolutely puts to the flame my cynicism about the F.P. Jorn brand. I'm not part of the cult of personality, and I'm into watches like JLC, Vacheron, Glasuta Original, Alangu Unzona, Kerry Voudelainen, smaller brands and unhyped brands. But I will say this, if you're gonna buy a Jorn, that's the one. That is a monster watch. And objectively, Mr. Jorn did a hell of a job with that piece. Sorry for all the bad things I've said about you. You are redeemed. <laughs> okay, jumping into the box right here. I got a question from Arno Soyez asking, what is the first vintage watch you would recommend for less than $20,000? For less than $20,000, I would say you spend much less than $20,000 because there's no need to spend big money on a vintage watch. I like old JLC Memovoxes from the 70s, and you shouldn't be paying more than three to $8,000 for them. You're gonna get a vintage watch made in small numbers by a great brand with a very useful complication, the alarm. My advice would be to get the watch I got, the Black Dial E877 Snowdrop. 40 millimeters, stainless steel, lugless, the best version of the Snowdrop, or I would say get a Polaris II from JLC, which was a dive watch that succeeded the original Polaris, but it was rare, to the point that they made fewer of the Polaris II than they did of the Polaris I. In terms of vintage Rolex, you'll find you have your pick of a 1680 and 5513 Submariners, as well as 1675 GMT Masters, and I think it's also important to look in unconventional places. $20,000 will buy you the original 1980 Corum Golden Bridge, designed by Vincent Calabresi and one of the greatest watches of the modern era. I would also say, realistically, get a Series 1 Zenith El Primero De Luca. It's almost like a Rolex Daytona dive watch, if I had to describe the character of the thing, but so much less common than any Rolex Daytona. You've got options. For $20,000, you're talking big money. I would also say consider getting yourself a stainless steel Patek Philippe Neptune full bracelet salmon dial from the 1990s, or the original 1996 Vacheron Constantin Overseas Chronometer. These are now vintage watches, and they need to be considered alongside the traditional 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s options. Jumping into the box, let's see if Backer ever got back to me with some of his prospective purchases. The problem is the chat box moves so fast, it's hard for me to keep up with your questions. Question from Williams Watches, Tim Cellini prints 5440 or Calatrava 5119J. I would get the Cellini prints. I'm a fan of the line. I think that they are rare, special, unusual, almost anti-Rolex choices for the Rolex cynics among us. And I also think that they are objectively beautiful. Also questions right here. The Loom Room. Tim, thoughts on the Tudor Chrono S and G? Well, if you're comfortable with the idea that you're getting a Breitling movement in a Tudor package, I think it's a nice watch. Keep in mind, with the steel gold models on the bracelet, you are getting a lot of gold-wrapped components, not solid gold. That's how the price point is possible. But if you like the two-tone look and you don't want to go with an 80s or 90s Rolex, it's definitely a great option as there are no questions about condition, patrimony, water resistance, or originality. So I think it's a great piece as long as it looks right to you. Bum, 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 bum. And then right here, we've got Ben D. Tim, what's your take on the Cartier tank basculant in quartz? Well, the basculant is sort of the Cartier reverso, if you will. So if you like that particular case design, and the old room, rumor that will not die is that that was the original reverso design. And Lecoultre basically re refused it 
gave it to Cartier and said, you take it, we don't want it. So if you like the Basculon, it's a rare enough version. If you can find one in Quartz, Quartz has its privileges. Cartier uses its own Quartz movements, so it is a purebred watch. It's undoubtedly luxury being Cartier. The brand name will never be in question. You just have to be comfortable with the idea that your luxury watch is not a mechanical timepiece, and I have no issues with that. Bushfriend27, hello from Bavaria. Thank you for joining me from southern Germany and staying up late with us in continental Europe. Right here, we have a question. Alternatives to the Baum & Mercier Baumatic in that price range. Well, for under 5,000 bucks, remember, you've got your choice of a million different awesome Omega DeVille models. I would go with one of those. Heck, you can probably get a used Hour Vision, blue dial or black, your choice for the price of a Clifton Balmatic. This is a timepiece that should be compared to pre-owned watches because you're gonna wind up getting something that's just a few years old that might be a more substantial watch in as much as it cost more new and occupied a higher price point. So consider any kind of pre-owned Omega. They definitely deserve consideration. And ba 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 bum ba bum Right here, we have Joshua Polanski, a good friend and a past collector conversation, our most popular ever, saying 1675 GMT Master, no quick set. That's a good point. Not forgotten. All right, jumping into one last round of wrist shots. Wrist shots for James C. and his FP Journ Chronomet Optimum. Looks like a boutique edition in rose gold black dial. Relaxing by the ferns. Gavin D. of the UK is dressed to impress with his FP Journ Chronomet a Resonance. Symmetrical dial. Love the watch. Love the composition. John A. and his Grand Seiko Godzilla 65th anniversary. Stomp Tokyo. In spirit, at least. Giancarlo P. takes us to the stars with the Omega Moon Watch and Saturn V rocket in Houston, Texas, USA. Remember guys, if you wanna buy a watch, Tmaso at thewatchbox.com, the direct purchase and price question line from you to me and my crew, and send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. I got two more watches on the table, both of them special, both of them precious metal. The first, the original 1999 Alonco Unzona Datagraph. 39 millimeters, platinum, a flyback chronograph, and a perfect watch. Flyback action, platinum case, perfectly balanced registers dropped below the cannon pinion, a dial black galvanized over sterling silver, the handsome stepped out longa lugs, and the landmark caliber 951 column wheel lateral clutch chronograph movement. This was the movement that forced Patek Philippe to end the era of Lamagna power. This was the movement that forced Patek Philippe to rethink its level of finish and detailing. This was the movement that launched a thousand fans of the still new family started brand from Eastern Germany. And this was the watch more than any other that convinced Richemont in 2000 it had to own the Longa brand. This is the most important chronograph of the 1990s and my personal favorite, co-equal with the Zenith Rainbow. A watch of unconventional background and unconventional composition. This was launched in 2014 and it's one of the thinnest tourbillon timepieces you'll find. A flying tourbillon, 42 millimeters in precious metal palladium. This is the Arnold & Son UTTE. 8.5 millimeters thick in palladium. This 42 millimeter watch includes a flying tourbillon caliber with a 90 hour power reserve, manual wind. You can see the tourbillon is extraordinarily large with a 14 millimeter diameter designed to dominate the dial, which features triple metallic finishing. The movement caliber 8200 features a gorgeous ruthenium coat and hand finishing right down to mirrored anglage double mainspring barrel artisanally finished from a great manufacturer, Arnold & Schoen, which is the brand name associated with the citizen-owned Swiss manufacturer, La Jupere. Ultra-thin tourbillon, flying tourbillon, independent horology, and backed by one of the most flush and thoroughly capitalized watch groups in the world. This is a no compromise watch from a very cool indie name. Guys in the box, Thank you so much. You made this episode a success, and it might be my last one for a while. We're thinking of drawing down here and minimizing operations. Uh, I am in marketing technically. Sales will continue to operate. Everything on our website remains available. You call, you will get an associate. I might not be back Monday, but we're looking at alternative solutions that might allow me to film from home. Until then, thanks to my crew for braving the elements and the lockdown. Sean and Garrett, thank you guys. 
Thanks to you. Thanks to my base of support back at home. Mom, I'll see you soon. Time out. Tim out. All be well. And thanks for logging on.